Hello, and welcome to the third and final presentation of a three-series tableting webinar hosted by Natoli Scientific. We are excited to share with you our tablet development technologies, including direct compression, dry granulation, wet granulation, and the tableting process. My name is Carrie Cruz, and I am the office manager and lab technician for Natoli Scientific in Telford, Pennsylvania, and I will be moderating this webinar series. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping tips. Our presenters will be sharing their slides, and if you would like to see all the presenters, please select all in the drop-down menu. Also, you will be muted during the, during the webinar, so please write your comments and questions in the chat box, and I will address them. Also, at the end of the presentation, there is a QR code that you can easily scan with your camera to provide feedback to the presenters. And finally, any questions we, not, we do not get to by the end of the webinar, we will reach out to you directly. So, with that out of the way, I would like to hand this over to Robert Sedlock, the Director of Natoli Scientific. He is a leading expert in tablet compression industry with over 20 years of experience and has authored numerous technical papers for pharmaceutical technology, American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, and peer-reviewed journals. Mr. Sedlock is responsible for solid dosage, customer support, training seminars, contract compression service, services, and continuous research in collaboration with many universities worldwide. Robert? Yes, thank you, Carrie, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for your attendance. This is the third uh, webinar of the series. Um, again, I'm Robert Sedlock. I'm here with Natoli Scientific, and I just want to give you a little background of Natoli Engineering before we move forward. Uh, so Natoli Engineering is located in St. Charles, Missouri. Uh, it was founded in 1973 by the late Carmelo Natoli. It's now being run uh, by Dale Natoli, who is our president and our CEO. Uh, Natoli Engineering offers 120,000 square feet of facility and campus where we provide manufacturing of compression tools and dyes. Uh, tablet presses, everything from single station to R&D rotary, the scale up pilot scale tablet presses up to manufacturing, all with the Natoli AIM data acquisition system. Uh, Natoli offers spare parts for all industry tablet presses, uh, not just Natoli machines, but all your common industry presses out there. Natoli has uh, spare parts and accessories for all of these machines. Um, the industries that we serve at Natoli include the pharmaceutical, the nutraceutical, the food confectionery, the cannabis industry, and industrial applications. Uh, Natoli mm -hmm. Engineering has many off-site facilities, um, a couple service centers, including uh, Long Island, New York, Cypress, California, Poland, uh, Carlisle Encapsulation in Idaho, uh, and many universities worldwide that we work with to combat tableting issues, uh, capping issues, robustness, sticking, picking issues. And one university in particular I like to mention is uh, Long Island University, Arnold Marie Schwartz uh, School of Pharmacy in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we have Parsh Shah here, who's uh, going to school there under uh, Dr. Ritesh Dave. Uh, so we work with many universities, but in particular LIU and Natoli Institute. So I want to thank Harsh and Dr. Dave. Um, here at Natoli Scientific is another off-site facility. Uh, this is where Carrie and I are based, and uh, Harsh was doing some work here as well. Uh, this is uh, over 14,000 square feet of facility in Telford, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was opened up a few years ago as a training center to help our customers develop tablets from, uh, from blending to formulation uh, development, picking the right excipients, all the different processes that you heard these webinars, direct compression, dry granulation, and wet granulation, fluid bed, film coating. So we have all these these, uh, these equipment and services that we provide. And we also focus on the micromoretics and powder rheology. So a lot of these issues you find in manufacturing all goes back to the root cause of the formulation. So we like to evaluate the morphology and the, the particle distribution, moisture content, things like that. Uh, one of the focuses we have here is scale up. Uh, seems to be a disconnect from research and development scaling up to the pilot scale. Uh, so we do a lot of work here and a lot of effort goes into uh, uh, achieving success from the bench scale R&D into the scale up uh, pilot scale into manufacturing. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it back over to Carrie. Great. Thank you, Robert. For this final webinar, we were fortunate enough to work with Harsh Shaw from LIU's Natoli Institute for Industrial, Industrial Pharmacy R&D and his extensive knowledge of the Diasna high shear or wet granulation equipment. Diasna was founded in 1885 in Germany for agricultural purposes but moved into the pharmaceutical mixing industry in 1957, focusing on high shear granulation and fluid bed processing. Harshaw 
is a final year PhD candidate in pharmaceutical sciences at Long Island University, Brooklyn, New York. He is doing his research under the guidance of Dr. Ritesh Dave. His current PhD work encompasses strategizing formulation development along with its pharmaco pharmacokinetic aspect of a poorly soluble drug by exploring amorphous solid dispersion techniques. Prior to starting his PhD, he was working as a formulation scientist at Sun Pharmaceuticals. During his experience as a formulation scientist, he got well accustomed to processes like wet granulation, di direct compression, tableting, top spray granulation, and pellet coating. As of today, he has one research paper published in the Journal of International Repute and two under review and has made presentations at various conferences. Now, to quickly review our agenda for today. During today's discussion, Harsh will present an overview of the capabilities of the diocesan equipment and the theories of wet granulation. We will then go into the specifics of processing the three APAP blends and the granulation results. After Harsh, Robert will discuss the details of the rotary tablet press and the tabletability profiles and strain rate sensitivity studies from the three APAP blends. Without further delay, I will let Harsh take over from here. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Carrie, for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone for this uh, part three series of the webinar of wet granulation and formulation uh, uh, and tabulating techniques. I'm going, uh, I'm going to briefly go over the granulation, basics of granulation, uh, the equipments which are being used for granulation, uh, followed by a couple of case studies, one from the literature and one from the uh, one from which we did at Telford, Pennsylvania with different uh, percentage of the APAP uh, and we did granulation and compared against the direct compression. So which uh, the results which, of which will be discussed by Robert. So uh, what is basically wet granulation? I'm sure uh, from the couple of uh, webs, uh, earlier webinars you might have attended. It's a size enlargement technique of fine, uh, for fine particles. Uh, but why do we need a wet granulation? So initially, uh, if you see uh, the fine powders, which is on your left, it, it, it has a poor flow, poor compressibility and segregation issue. And this is particularly important for in pharmaceuticals. So if, if you have an API uh, or you have a different excipients, which are having different densities, uh, there are chances of segregation and this may lead to non uh, different content uniformity and and it it is certainly a no for a pharmaceutical product so by granulation you can avoid this you can get a better flow better compressibility uh, segregation issues can be solved and certainly uh, it there would be an improved content uniformity uh, following this so uh, manufacturing of tablets it, there are basically three processing uh, techniques for uh, formation of the granules uh, one is direct compression blend, and it's it's the first and the most preferred uh, technique to prepare a blend is just uh, blending it in a blender, and boom, it's ready for compression. Followed by di direct compression, dry granulation or roller compaction, uh, and followed by wet granulation. So uh, this, uh, when going from direct compression to uh, wet dry granulation to wet granulation. Uh, there is always an increase in processing time and variables, and there is certainly an increase in uh, cost. But however, if you have a drug or if you have a product which is having a high drug load, uh, you need wet granulation so to have its enhanced flow and compressibility character. So it's always a, a balance between the cost and the processing and the final pro uh, product which you want. So uh, what are the basics of, uh, we are gonna go to, towards the basics of the wet granulation. It's, it's like uh, making a dough, but it's, it's a much prior process or uh, you don't want dough in a granulation. It's much earlier process. So what happens is basically when you put a binder solution, there is a powder wetting, which is uh, involved, followed by nucleation. That is formation of the liquid bridge uh, between the smaller granules followed by agglomeration of bigger granules, uh, attrition and breakage. So as you can see, the powder wetting is a critical critical attribute in 
uh, granulation and uh, in this uh, binder should, should be selected in such a way uh, that it should have a minimal uh, the contact angle between the powder and the binder is minimal for example let's say if you are using talc and if you are granulating with water it's a no no because talc is really hydrophobic and it won't allow the water molecules to come near and the granulation uh, won't be commenced further so uh, the attrition and the breakage is attributed to the impeller and the chopper speed uh, which will further densify and break the granules and which we are going to go uh, in detail in the further sections and uh, further subsequent sections so uh, first is in, in any granulation process first is powder wetting nucleation uh, and finally the agglomeration attrition and breakage so what which are the basic equipments uh, that are used in wet granulation uh, so uh, we are going to briefly go over the high shear uh, uh, the fluid bed granulation apart from the high shear granulation uh, but there are basically two equipments which are used for wet granulation currently one is high shear granulation and the second is uh, fluid bed granulation uh, so historically you know, earlier what they used to do they just had a ball and a shaft which, which you used to rotate the blend and from the top they used to put the uh, binding solution and that was the most conventional method and after that there has been much uh, scientific progress in terms of uh, 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 granulation and optimization of the granulation batches and especially this is important when you scale up from a uh, uh, from a lab scale to the to a more pr production scale which is which is critical so this is a, a, a on your right you see a high shear granulator from the Ausna, and on your left is a schematic of a, a granulating bowl so as you can see on the bottom there is a chopper uh, uh, impeller and on perpendicular to it is a chopper the, Mark, the main function of the impeller is to mix the blend and uh, uniformly during the addition of the binding solution the binding solution can be uh, dripped or it can be sprayed whichever method is convenient to the uh, industry and followed by chopper it comes much later on the granulation process when the granulation endpoint is reached you just want to break the granules uniformly so initially you don't need chopper uh and first uh, you start with the impeller and followed by the chop uh, chopper and after the granulation and point each reach so the major advantage of high shear granulation, and this is a top view of the as you can see the impeller and uh, perpendicular to it there is a chopper so the major advantage of high shear granulation is uh it is used for uh, extremely low density powders so for example, if you want to uh, the granulate colloidal sil silicon dioxide, which uh, has extremely low density, uh, you cannot granulate it in uh, uh, fluid bed granulation because uh, it will bind to the filters, which we'll see in the, the next slide. Uh, hence, this can produce higher densified granules and the powders you can process, which are extremely low dense. However, uh, the disadvantage of uh, high shear granulation, it would be a separate uh, equipment for drying. Uh, it may be a tray dryer conventional method or it may be a fluid by fluid bed dryer. Secondly, uh, this is the fluid bed, uh, fluid bed granulation. Uh, as you can see on your left, how the process work is there is, a, there is an inlet air uh, which fluidizes the uh, granules or the blend, initial blend and from the top uh, there is a spray so there is a partial drying of the granules apart from uh, the formation of the liquid bridges so on the top there are filters to minimize or to avoid any fines escaping this uh, fluid bed uh, processing unit uh, and uh, the major advantage of using a fluid bed granulation is uh, the, the the granules which are formed are porous so they are better compressible uh, the, the density is slightly less compared to the wet granulation technique, but uh, uh, you you will certainly find a porous granules. Uh, a disadvantage of using high shear granulation is you cannot process the powders which are extremely low dense. Uh, it, the reason is even with a lower amount of heat flow or heat, heated airflow, 
the, it may stick to the filters on the top and nothing remains on the bottom to granulate. So these are the, again the advantages of porous granules, uh, granulation drying. And also since granulation and drying are simultaneous, you can input more amount of liquid on the wet uh, on the blend, especially if you have a higher amount of liquid to be sprayed on the granulation. This is perfect equipment, uh, and again, low density powders can, are difficult to process. So, uh, in this series, we're going to focus on high shear granulation. What are the uh, uh, steps for high shear granulation? So, following this. So first off, uh, first off is mixing uh, in uh, mixing of components, especially if it's a pharmaceutical uh, uh, product, the API and the XCAP needs to be mixed properly. So the impeller, usually in the pharmaceutical or industrial scale, what they usually do is uh, they dump everything in, in, in the granulating bowl and they, they, they rotate the impeller for five minutes just to make sure it's uh, uh, mixed properly sorry, mixed properly before the addition of the binding solution, followed by applying of the binding solution. Uh, here, the rate is really critical. Too low is uh, too low application rate is time consuming and too, uh, too high rate or application rate. You might miss the granulation endpoint and uh, there, may, there are chances of formation of slurries, which you don't really want it, followed by drying. So, uh, uh, there are a couple of steps uh, in between uh, granulation and drying. Uh, some industry, they, they do prefer, and depending on the granules properties, they sieve it or mill it before putting into drying just to make sure the drying is uniform. Uh, uh, some, they prefer it after, after drying it. So the drying process involves either by conventional tray drying or fluid by dry, followed by milling of the granules to obtain the uniform particle size. So, uh, so again, it is it is critical in this wet granulation. And as I said earlier, earlier uh, previously they used to just use a, a bowl and a shaft, which we used to rotate, and uh, granulation was uh, done. And uh, they used to manually check the granulation endpoint. But uh, now uh, it, there has been uh, advancement in this. So it is critical when to stop the uh, determined or when to stop in the wet granulation process. So because if it's below the wet granulation process, the granules might not hold while drying or further processing, and there are chances of generation of fines. Uh, now the problem with fines, you need certain amount of fines in your uh, granules certainly to for better compressibility. But if there is too much fines, there are chances that it may lead to capping or uh, the static uh, charges associated with the fines can uh, uh, can make the tabulating a, a bit messy. Uh, and if you go above the granulation endpoint, uh, there are transformation of slurry, uh, which is certainly you don't require in wet granulation or lumps, which is also called uh, as a balling phenomena, and definitely not this. So this is uh, known as a molding. Uh, of uh, or uh, it, it's majorly seen in a control release polymer. So uh, in the pharmaceutical, if, if, if you're using a control release polymer, the granulation endpoint is really narrow. So uh, if you go, be, go below the, the, the granulation endpoint, uh, the granules are really soft. And if you go above that, uh, you will see this kind of molding. And it, this is certainly a no in the production scale because uh, as many of you attending the seminar might have experienced uh, or not sure, uh, this kind of uh, lumps formed are really hard to break. And if this happens in a production level, uh, you, you would certainly have a loss and someone is getting fired for this. So it's critical to avoid this. So, but how would you determine the wet granulation process? So. When you are, uh, it, it's critical what actually you are targeting. So empirically, it can be defined if you're targeting the wet, wet mass density. Uh, is it a mean particle size distribution and powder flow properties and compressibilities? Uh, so uh, as I said, the when the impeller rotates, there is a certain amount of power consumption. And uh, if you see the, uh, power consumption and the torque at, associated with the impeller uh, speed. So if you are trying to run at 100 RPM, the 
initial blend since it doesn't have any wet mass it's free to move so uh, if you see on your left side uh, on your right side the graph it's really low the torque as attached associated with the uh, before addition of the binder solution it's really low so as soon as you start uh, as soon as you start the granulation uh, and binder solution it will go up and you need to be in this range uh, that's the granulation end point because after as soon as you go above it there is a decrease in the uh, power consumption or the torque which is an indication that you are above the granulation end point and uh, uh, your product is uh, failed or you, it, the processing uh, you cannot process it further so it, it's really important uh, to be in this region in, uh, while granulating Apart from the, so uh, till now, uh, you might have got a clue about the processing variables in high shear granulation, but I'm gonna quickly go over it. Uh, so first uh, in high shear granulation, first and most important thing is the bed size. Uh, the, if the bed size is too low, when you are spraying it, that when they are spraying it and, and when the impeller is rotating, there is a gap or uh, where uh, there is a small gap which comes uh, now and then, which does not have a blend and uh, the binder solution is just pouring on over there so there are chances that you will get localized wetting or uh, you'll see a lo localized lumps and if you have a bed size higher than that there are chances that you will see uh, you'll find a, a non-uniform mixing so that has to be optimized uh, solvent type again it's critical usually uh, industry now they are trying to go green uh, by using water as a solvent uh, but sometimes uh, if the material is too hydrophobic uh, you cannot use water as a binder solution you need to use either uh, something like povidon uh, in, in water to increase decrease the contact angle or improve the wettability or use a different solvent non-aqueous solvents like ethanol or uh, ipa uh, followed by type of material again uh, it depends on the type of material you are using uh, uh, let's say mcc it tends to swell uh, when adding adding more uh, water into it and uh, this occupy the occupancy of the granulator is uh, it's kind of uh, uh, increase so you need to consider uh, all that point during wet granulation uh, and finally fi binder addition rate this is again critical as i mentioned earlier uh, if you are below and above the granulation endpoint or if you are adding it uh, really fast uh, to uh, avoid uh, time loss what you are certainly doing is uh, uh, you are increasing the risk uh, to for a back product so you that has to be optimized before going for a scale up and uh, speed of the impeller and chopper uh, so why I would say sp uh, speed of the impeller and chopper are critical is because it will determine the densification of the granules. So uh, if if you uh, if you have a granules uh, you want it to be porous, uh, and if it's if those granules are going for uh, tabletability and compressibility, so if you are uh, using impeller and chopper speed for a longer period of time, what it will essentially do is it it will make the granules dense that is it will make it less porous so it may or may it may lose its uh, tabletability and compressibility so you essentially need to avoid that or uh, try to optimize that i'm not saying it's a, it, it it's always that the case but this is one critical point you have to consider while uh, doing a granulation of a uh, material and this all parameters will define uh, the endpoint of the granulation and the granules properties so what are the things to be careful during a granulation uh, as i said and discussed earlier granulation addition rate of the granulation fluid uh, you need to be careful you need uh, the uh, granules to be porous uh, and uh, for better compressibility hence over densification may lead to reduced compressibility uh drying process must be optimized again as i said earlier if you're using a fluid bed granulation uh there is a lot of turbulence involved in it 
and uh, this may lead to uh, generation of fines and you need to avoid that some portion of generation uh, some portion of fines are uh, okay in a uh, granules so but you know, don't need a greater percentage of fines so after that so when you are scaling up from a lab scale to a, a pilot scale or a, or a production scale uh, which uh, critical attributes or which uh, characterization uh, granule properties you're going to target it's it's critical for uh, for granules it's critical that you remain especially when you are uh, doing a scale up uh, from a lab scale to a production scale the particle size distribution is consistent uh, between both the processes or both the lab scale and the production scale so for that you can either perform sieve analysis or uh, there has been laser diffraction uh, uh, technique uh, which is a more advanced technique and uh, uh, you just have to after the granulation or after drying of the granules you just target those granules because this will determine ultimately if it's a control release this is again critical because this will determine the release profile of a drug from uh, and the tabletability followed by moisture content uh, usually in a granulation process or after drying it is recommended to have around two to three percent of the moisture content in granules uh, below it there are chances uh, that uh, you will uh, you will see a uh, capping um, and uh, generation of uh, static and uh, about the granulation or about the moisture content or let's say higher moisture content can lead to sticking so you have to optimize that for example uh, uh, in uh, metformin uh, is a drug which has high drug load like let's say it, it is a 500 milligram dose or a thousand milligram dose but the thing is, is with metformin is uh you need to have a moisture content in the granules about three percent if it's below that it will the product is going to show capping so you need to have uh, uh moisture content about three percent sometimes in the production scale there are chances that they it may go below three percent and what the, they try to do is just uh put some moisture in it or spray some moisture in it just to uh, I know it's it's uh, it's a, a deviation, but that's what they can do. Followed by porosity. Uh, again, porosity, as I said earlier, is critical for compression. You can measure it uh, using pycnometer, uh, helium pycnometer. Helium pycnometer truly gives the actually gives the true density, but from that you can measure the porosity, which is uh, is one minus uh, bulk density divided by true density. So it's it's critical you uh, you target the porosity too for for the optimum uh, tablet characteristics and followed by uh, density, bulk density, tab density, flow properties and compressibility, which can be either measured by uh, this uh, tab density meter or the people who might have attended uh, the webinar part one of this webinar series granny tools have uh, have really sensitive equipment to measure this uh, stuff so uh, you can check out granny tools uh, regarding this the measurement of this bulk uh, and tab density and flow properties uh, now coming back to the case study as i mentioned earlier uh, we will go through two case studies one from the literature i took it uh, it's just a small i mean it's a actually extensive case study but i just uh, narrowed it down to the conclusion and what they exactly did is what they just took a, a, a regular anhydrous lactose which is a bulking agent in uh, most of the pharmaceutical product povidone which is a binder cross povidone is a disintegrant and magnesium stearate so what they did, they did the uh, design of experiment and they had three uh, input variables or independent variables, which was by the addition rate, impeller speed, uh, and as I said earlier, higher speed, impeller speed may lead to a lower tablet strength and lower impeller speed uh, may lead to higher tablet strength. So they wanted to study that. And third was the moisture content of the granules. So and uh, the final uh, how did they measure the output or uh, the effect of these three variables by was by measuring the output variable as tablet tablet strength uh, and what did they exactly found out was the moisture content in this part of uh, formulation was 
uh, important in, in defining the tablet strength as compared to the binder addition rate or the impeller, impeller speed. So, uh, I mean, this is the, one of the case study. It's not always some, in some cases, there may be uh, the scenario that binder addition rate or impeller speed may be critical. Uh, but in, in this case, we found, they found out that moisture content was the uh, critical attribute, the, defining the characteristic of the tablet strength. Uh, the second case study we did was with uh, wet granulation. Uh, we compared wet granulation uh, versus direct compression. The reason uh, we took APEP with increasing uh, concentration of uh, that is three different blends of uh, APEP with 20%, 40%, and 60%. So as you can see, it goes from a green to red. Uh, it's it's because 20% drug load was uh, or can be easily compressed. Basically, APEP is elastic in nature, uh, so and it has really bad flow. So you need some diluent or bulking agent or a processing technique to make it uh, a, a better flow or better uh, compressibility properties. So uh, apart from that, we used ProSol is a silicified uh, microcrystalline cell cellulose. Uh, inherently, uh, SMCC ProSol SMCC does have a good flowability but uh, on increasing the APAP concentration and we are compensating with the ProSol, so there was a reduction in flow and uh, there was a reduction in tabletability as uh, the, the results will be discussed by uh, Robert. And magnesium state was added as a lubricant, 0.5%. So what uh, we did was we used uh, diosna, uh, lab scale high shear granulation. Again, diosna has a, a lot of equipments uh, and they have a lot of expertise in high shear granulation and feedback granulation. Uh, you can check out the website. It, 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 they have equipments from uh, lab scale, which uh, uses 0.25 liters, which is much of a smaller scale lab scale to 1800 liters of the uh, capacity, which is uh, production. And we, uh, in this uh, case, just to avoid any more variables, we uh, added water as a binding solution. And, uh, and then we studied it for the flow properties and compressibilities. So uh, the results of which will be uh, discussed by Robert. And uh, thank you so much everyone for your time and attending this uh, webinar. Hope this session was uh, useful and I'll be glad if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to uh, put in the questions in the box, uh, chat box and uh, uh, as soon as at the end of the webinar, I'll be uh, able to answer your queries, hopefully. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, everything back to you, Robert. Okay, thank you very much, Harsh, for that excellent overview of the wet granulation process. Robert will now present the details of the rotary tablet press, tabletability, and strain rate sensitive, sensitivity profiles of the three APAP blends. And there you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Harsh, for a very nice presentation on uh, wet granulation with the Adaza, Diaza equipment that we have here at Natoli Scientific. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is the subsequent tableting and the compaction studies and strain rate sensitivity studies. So before we go into that, I just want to quickly review some of the things that we talked about in session one and session two. Um, so again, we're comparing APAP formulations at 20, 40, 60% drug load, uh, and we're looking at three different processes, direct compression, dry granulation, roller compaction, and high shear wet granulation. We want to look at these three different processes and evaluate it. Uh, in our first series, we did a lot of focus on the micromoretics using granule tools equipment. And we had uh, Aurelian uh, present on this information. So we'd like to focus on the, the powder characteristics first. Um, then we like to go to something called the Prester, which is our compaction emulator. This machine is like a rotary tablet press production scale, but on a linear fashion. So you, you, um, 
you apply the material into the, the uh, die cavity or use a feed shoe, and you tell the computer software, which is the AIM data acquisition system, uh, what press you're trying to emulate. So if you're trying to emulate an Atoli MP500 at 50 RPM, it's going to know the velocity, and the dwell time, and the loading rates. And then this carriage is going to go through that whole compression process, but on a linear fashion. Uh, so making one tablet at a time, it's going to make a tablet at speed of production, uh, and this machine reaches up at two meters per second. Uh, we ran most of our studies at one meter per second because that's a typical range for uh, for manufacturing, but you can go up at two meters per second. Uh, and the presser is highly instrumented for measuring pre-compression force, ejection force, uh, main compression force, sticking force, radial die wall force. And the key thing here is we're measuring punch displacement. So as we are compressing that single tablet, we're measuring the in die thickness real time. And that data will allow us to look at work curves and heckle plots where the work curve will allow us to evaluate the elasticity of the plastic or brittleness of the material. Um, and the, the heckle plot will tell us what the yield pressure is. So how much pressure is required to cause those particles to deform and start bonding? We need to know that information so we're not over compressing. Um, and even on bilayer tablets, uh, multi-layer, layer one compression is gotta be below a certain level so you don't over compress. And then when you compress both layers, they delaminate. So using the heckle plots, we can determine what is the, the appropriate pressure or force for layer one compression. Uh, but even on monolayer tablets, this is very valuable. Uh, if we can characterize the API with the presser, then we know what type of excipients to add in. Do we want plastic deforming excipients? want brittle material? Uh, what percentages? So it's a very useful machine that will allow us to understand the deformation properties. The typical process is you start on a single station machine like the RD10A. This is an Atoli system. This only requires a very limited amount of material, let's say less than one gram and you can compress tablets and measure the force and pressure, use the AIM data acquisition system to understand tabletability, compactability, compressibility, because the program will allow you to enter in the true density of your product. And if you know the tablet density, it'll calculate the solid fraction and porosity. Um, but this machine, the way it compresses, it's not like the rotary. The upper punch comes down vertically, releases vertically, and ejects vertically. The rotary process, the punches are moving around a turret, and they're going through cams and rollers. So then we go to the RD30, which is our rotary uh, lab scale machine, which can also be used for pilot scale. Uh, but this machine was specifically designed for scale up. So you can use limited amount of material, but you can get up to over one meter per second on that velocity. So you can run trials on this RD30 at manufacturing um, velocities. And then you can go to the production press, which is the MP400. So the advantages of the compaction emulator, it uses limited amount of material and it can be compressed at a rate that's representable of manufacturing speeds. You can also measure heckle plots, work curves, compression data, solid fraction, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages of the emulator, but eventually you need to go to the rotary press process. But having that data at the base level to help you get these tools to identify what excipients you need to get a robust tablet that is robust even at manufacturing rates is very important. And that's what the emulator does for you. So like Harsh said, there's three different processes, direct compression, roller compaction, and wet granulation. Uh, we're gonna focus on the wet granulation, but we're gonna compare the roller compaction data and the direct compression against the wet granulation blend. So let's talk about the compression process. This is very important that we understand every step of the compression process, because once you identify and understand it at this level, it's the same for every tablet press. There is one machine out there called the Ema Caprima, a very nice, unique machine that does not follow all of these stages the way you see it here, but every other machine out there does. So if you understand this and you're having tabling problems, uh, you can understand and identify it's a, if it's a processing of the, uh, the machine issue or is it a formulation issue. Okay, so let's start. The upper part of the turret has your upper punches. Then you have your die table with your dies. Then you have your lower part of the turret that has your lower punches. The first step here is your die filling step. And what's going to happen is there's a fill cam on the bottom part of the press that's going to pull your lower punch down. 
and the clearance of your lower punch tip in your die is, is a tight clearance, so it creates a partial vacuum. So as that punch pulls down in the fill cam stage, it creates a vacuum. And it's actually going to suck material from the feeder into the die. You want that to occur. And if you look closely, where's my mouse? There it is. As the lower punch is being pulled down in this image here, you'll see granulation is going into the die. That is very important. There's a lot of older tablet presses out there, or even new presses that are designed like the old models, that the fill cam is actually pulling down before the feeder. So it's pulling down right around this area, and it's pulling in air. There's no powder. And then the punch and die come underneath your feeder, and hopefully that granulation has great flow properties so it flows into the die properly. Um, if you have a machine out there that's limited with turret speed, let's say you only get like 50% of the speed, now your weights are no longer consistent, it might not be your product. It could be the design of your tablet press. So you want to make sure that your fill cam is located under the opening of your feeder. If it's not, Natoli has a solution called a fast track. We can actually replace your fill cam and put in a new design in that same tablet press, and it's designed to hold a dwell until it gets to the opening of the feeder and it pulls down. And as it pulls down, there's powder going from the uh, feeder into the die cavity. That's what you need to get consistent tablet weights, especially at high speed. Okay, so now you have your fill cam. Then you have your volume adjustment, which is your dosing cam or weight cam adjustment. The operator can adjust the dosing. So your fill cam is going to overfill the die, and then your dosing is going to push the lower punch up and scrape off the excess to achieve your weight. So it's a two-step process. Your fill cam will overfill the die, and then your dosing pushes out the excess and scrapes it off. You want that two-step process because as you're pushing out the excess, it's consolidating the particles to give you a more consistent fill. So you want to do that, but you don't want to overfill too much. So you want a, your fill cam to overfill, eh, let's say, 20% of your, your tablet weight. If you go above that, that's excessive material. Where does that excess powder go when it gets scraped off? It gets recycled in the center groove of your turret and comes around as the turret rotates and goes back into your feeder. It recycles that material. That sounds like a good thing. It is a great thing for, uh, for yield, but it's not a good thing if your formulation is sensitive to blend times. So if you're using a lubricant like magnesium stearate, for example, when do we add mag stearate in? We add it at the end of the blend. How long do we blend it? A very short period. Why? Because you can over lubricate and over blend your formula with mag stearate. Mag stearate is like a deck of cards, and as soon as you spread it, it spreads everywhere. It starts coating all the particle surfaces, and that prevents bonding of your particles. It also prevents the penetration of fluids in your stomach. Um, so if you, you need a fast disintegration time, lubrication is not going to help you because it, it doesn't allow the fluid to penetrate. So magnesium stearate is needed or lubricant, but you don't want to overdo it, and you don't want to overfill your dye too much and have that excess powder go around. Your paddle feeders are blenders. You think blending stops when your V-blender turns off? It doesn't. Blending continues until you actually compress it and make a tablet. So your paddle feeders on your tablet press is actually a blender. So if you have a process where beginning a process, you got a robust tablet, and then after a few hours of running time, your hardness keeps going down lower and lower and lower, it's probably because you're over lubricating and over blending that max theory in your feeder. So how do you reduce that? You want your fill cam to be about two to four millimeters more in your dosing cam. So if you have a 500 milligram tablet weight and your dosing is say 10 millimeters of dosing to achieve that 500 milligrams based off that bulk density and cross-sectional area, you want your fill can to be about 12 to 14 millimeters. So it's pulling in about two to four millimeters more than what you need. If you're pulling in more than that, then you're going to recirculate excessive amount of material. You have over blending potential. So that's a problem. Uh, so the fill can must be uh, properly chosen based off your dosing cam settings. So be, be careful of that. This is a common issue in the industry where they're using the same fill cam for all products. That's not what you want to do to optimize your process. So fill cam, dosing cam. Then you have two compression stages. You have a pre-compression and you have a main compression. The pre-compression is a deoration uh, and consolidates the particles. What you don't want to happen in pre-compression is you don't want to deform the particles and create bonding. 
because if you create bonding at pre-compression, when you hit it again under main compression, you're going to destroy the microstructure. You're going to have lamination, delamination, you have capping issues and other type of compression issues. So the pre-compression is only to consolidate the particles, get them close together, because as the particles are touching each other, that's going to favor robustness during uh, main compression. Now, as a formulator and in R&D, I like to formulate our products such that we don't need pre-compression at the R&D scale. Because if you need pre-compression, meaning that you have a low hardness, you have capping issues, um, so pre-compression is helping you, you want to reformulate and fix it so you don't need pre-compression. Why? Because if you develop without pre-compression to R&D, you scale up into pilot scale manufacturing and you see these compression issues, you have pre-compression as a backup tool where if you develop with pre-compression, you're gonna need it when you scale up. And if you have these issues, you have no backup tool. So as a formulating scientist, I like to keep pre-compression uh, to the side, not use it until we need it. And hopefully that's in manufacturing is when we find we might need it. Now you put a little bit of pre-compression on, now you're good. How much pre-compression force do you put on? This is where the heckle plot helps us with the presser. If our heckle constant for microcrystal cellulose is 20 megapascal, then I know I don't want to go above 20 megapascals on pre-compression because I'm going to create bonding of the particles. So maybe I'm at 15 megapascals. All right, then you have the main compression. And this is actually where we wanted to form the particles under compaction and create bonding. So we're going to apply a load here. The main compression has an upper roller and lower roller. So does the pre. But the main compression, one roll is going to adjust the tablet thickness, the force, and the hardness. And the other role is your punch penetration. Where in the die do you want to make that tablet? Do you want to make it right in the middle of the die? You want to make it a top part, a low part? We typically make it up in kind of the middle to high part, but you have the ability to adjust where you make that tablet in the die. Uh, and this could help you with some issues you're having in manufacturing. Uh, and that's called a punch penetration. After the main compression, you have the decompression event. So after you apply a load to the powder and form a tablet, you got a load on the top surface, bottom surface, and around the die wall. After you make a tablet, the upper punch is released first. So the load's still on the lower punch and against the die wall. So the tablet wants to expand upward because that's where you release the load. Then when you eject the tablet, this is where you might see capping. When that tablet peeks out of the die and it pops off, that's like the hat pops off, we call that capping. Uh, and you'll find that at the decompression stage. After decompression, you have two more steps. This is confused as one step. So after you form a tablet, the upper punch is released. Now we want to eject the tablet. The tablet has to overcome the residual die wall force pushing it into the tablet and the friction between the compacting die wall. So if your ejection force is too high, that's going to cause premature wear to your punches and cams. You might see striation, these lines that are vertical around your belly band of your tablet. How do you reduce that? Either reduce the compression force, which reduces the radial die wall force, or you add lubricant, magnesium steric, pru, steric acid. You know, there's a number of different lubricants, and that reduces the coefficient of friction between a compact and die wall, and that allows you to eject the tablet. But one common problem is if you're putting too much lubricant in, your ejection's real low, that's great, but too much lubrication could cause capping issues, robustness issues, dissolution issues, flow issues. Uh, so you don't want to over lubricate your formula. So there's a study called uh, uh, Compaction Profile where we look at the ejection force or pressure. As we increase compaction pressure, we're monitoring the ejection force. Looking at this profile, we can then optimize the amount of lubricant we put in. After the ejection, you have one more step. So after you eject the tablet, the tablet's sitting at the lower punch face. Now you have to remove it from the takeoff bar. You have to physically push it off the lower punch face. So as this punch comes around, and hit the takeoff bar. This is where we see sticking problems and picking problems. Sticking is when the powder starts to adhere to the punch face. Picking is associated when you have a logo or embossing and you have material between the crevices, like a zero, the land, or certain numbers will cause, like eights will cause picking issues. That's the takeoff stage. So if you have an ejection issue, you address it differently than a takeoff issue. One common problem I see, if you have a sticking issue, let's add more max stare That'll reduce my sticking. Well, a lot of times it causes even more sticking issues because the more lubricant you put on, the less bonding between particles will happen because you've got a layer of lubricant there. 
So if the particles don't want to bond to each other, the particles are going to bond to the punch face. So adding more lubricant does not always fix sticking issues. I add lubricant to reduce the ejection force, and we use other techniques to reduce picking and sticking issues. Okay, Natoli, uh, we work with so many customers that have sticking and picking issues. It's probably the number one talc manufacturing issue out there. We spend a lot of energy focusing on how to reduce these issues. So there's a lot of solutions out there. Um, there's different steel types for your punches. There's different coatings. Um, there, there's a lot of techniques out there to help you reduce that. But a lot of this goes all the way back to the R&D scale. When we want to push our product to the limits to understand where it fails. If you're an R&D and you're making great tablets all the time and your product's good and you scale up, that's wonderful. But what we like to do is we like to push it. We want to go from lowest pressure to highest pressure. We want to know when this product caps. We want to know where we over compress. We want to know when we reduced all the porosity and now we got no more compressibility. You want to know all that stuff at R&D. So when you scale this in a different stages, a pilot scale up manufacturing, you know this product inside out and backwards. You know when it's going to fail. You know where to be. So that's what we're going to focus on here. And the first study that we're running is called a compaction profile, but technically it's a tabletability study. What is a tabletability study? Well, first of all, we ran this on Natoli's uh, MPRD30. Uh, this is the workhorse for all of our tabletability studies and strain rate sensitivity. And we want to keep tablet weight constant, and we want to incrementally increase our compaction pressure and collect a sample of tablets at each increment and measure the tablet weight, the thickness, the hardness, breaking force, maybe friability, disintegration, dissolution, and so on. And we enter that into the AIM data acquisition system, and it gives you these profiles. Notice what we're looking at. It's the tensile strength as a function of the compaction pressure. I didn't use hardness in KP, and I didn't use compression force in kilonewtons. Why? You can, but this is a normalization. Why do we do this? Well, if I use KP, well, first of all, KP stands for kilopond. P-O-N-D. It's not a real engineering unit. It's equal to one kilogram force exerted at sea level. So when you see KP, it's really KGF. Um, another, another unit would be Newtons, and you may have heard of strong cobs before as well. Those are units of force. So the hardness of breaking force will increase when you increase the mass. So if someone says, I have a hardness of 50 KP, that might sign, sound very high to me, but if my tablet is this big, it's three inch diameter, 50 kp is not high at all. But if I convert it to tensile strength, where I take the hardness um, divided by the fracture area times pi, it takes into account the tablet geometry, the hardness, and it normalizes that hardness into a pressure. So now it's independent of size. We typically target between one and two megapascal tensile strength. We use the Fell Newton equation. If you're interested in this, please uh, contact us. I'll send you a paper with all the different equations for flat face, round, concave, capsules. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but this is a way to normalize. So if you told me now my tensile strength for this tablet is two megapascal, I don't care if it's a mini tablet or a tablet as big as your office. Two megapascal is a robust tablet um, and it's normalized for its size. Same thing with compaction pressure. I'm not using force in kilonewtons. I'm using megapascal, which is a million pascals. The pascal is a newton meter squared. Uh, it's a metric system for, uh, uh, for pressure here. Now, if someone told me I compress my tablet 100 kilonewtons of force, you might think that's very high. But again, what if it's a three inch diameter tablet? 100 kilonewtons is not high at all. But if you tell me I compress that certain megapascal, now you're normalized. It's the force divided by the cross-sectional area of your tooling. I'm normalized for the tablet cross-sectional area. Um, if you say I compressed at 50 megapascals, 50 is a very low number. If you made a tablet at 50 megapascal, I'm going to say you probably compressed microcrystal cellulose or something like an excipient that's designed to be very robust. If you told me I compressed at 400 megapascals, I would ask what industry you're in. If you say pharmaceutical, I'm going to say that's way too high. You have to reformulate it. If you're in some other applications like the automobiles or batteries or compressing metals and you're trying to get all the porosity out, then yeah, 400 megapascals might be correct. But most pharmaceutical products, they lie between 100 and 200 megapascals, right in that range. When you start to go to vitamins and nutraceuticals, now you're in a two to 300 megapascal. 
If you're above 300, now you're kind of out of the pharma, neutral world, you're more in the other uh, industrial applications. So if someone told me I compressed at 100 megapascals and made a tablet of two megapascal tin cell strength, I'd say that's a great formula. That's a relatively low pressure and you got two megapascal tin cell, that's a robust tablet that's gonna survive uh, the coating process, the friability, shipping, handling, and so on. Okay, so again, tensile between one and two megapascal. Now, if you want an ODT, an orderly disintegrating tablet, it needs to disintegrate less than 30 seconds. There's certain materials you add in that are super disintegrants, but in those particular products, your tensile strength might be at one, maybe a little lower than one megapascal. So depending on your product and how fast you want the disintegration properties, uh, that'll determine your tensile strength. So what are we looking at here? We are comparing your direct compression, which is the blue, the roller compacted blend, which is your dry granulation, which is the orange, and then the gray is the wet granulation blend with 20% APAP drug load. So small drug load, uh, the three different processes, you'll see to achieve two megapascal tensile, the direct compression and the wet granulation blend were very similar. Um, it only required about 80 megapascals of tensile. That's a very low pressure. If all you need is 20% drug load for APAP, we could do this easily. Um, a very low compaction pressure. You're not going to wear your tools quickly. Your tablet press is going to, the force is going to be very low, so you won't wear out your press quickly. Um, and if you roller compact it, you need more pressure because uh, we're losing some of that energy through the compaction process of the roller compactor. But it's still very reasonable. You're still about 130 megapascals of pressure, which is very normal for pharmaceutical. Okay, so 20% drug load looked like direct compression was okay. The flow ability is not so great. So at high rotary press speed of manufacturing, you might not be able to get the output you need because the flow ability is not there. But I, you will get there with the uh, high shear granulation process. You're going to increase density and in your flow ability with high shear wet granulation. Same thing with roller compaction. You'll increase the flow and bulk density. You'll achieve your, your flow ability and your output. Uh, and you can achieve your strength at a relatively uh, not medium kind of pressure, uh, 130 megapascals. That's kind of low, actually. Um, so now let's go to 40% and 60% drug load. As we increase our APAP drug load, if you remember from session one, we're going to increase the elastic recovery, which is not a good thing for tableting. We want our tablet to hold a lot of work and energy after compression and after we release the load. You want that tablet to keep that energy, where if you got an elastic material like APAP, when you release the load, the tablet wants to come back to its original form, uh, a lot of elastic recovery. So I would expect a weaker tablet at the same pressure as we increase the drug load. Okay, so let's look at 40%. We're looking at tensile strength as a function of compaction pressure again. Uh, to achieve two megapascal, you'll see we now need to run the direct compression and the wet granulation about 150 megapascal, which is still very reasonable for a pharmaceutical product. Uh, and then the roller compacted blend, you're going to have to go closer to like 220 megapascal, which is on the higher end, but 220 is still reasonable. It's not excessive. Uh, we're getting closer to 300, which is starting to be excessive. Uh, most tool maximum pressures, depending on the shape and uh, if it's an exotic design and logos, you should be getting in the 500, 600 megapascal range before that tool fails. So that's, you know, all the way up to 500, 600 megapascal. But if you got an exotic tool shape uh, and different steel, that'll reduce the max force uh, and you might be reducing that pressure maybe closer to 300. But anyway, here's our 40%. We achieved our uh, 2 megapascal with the direct compression wet granulation, relatively low pressure. The roller compacted blend took more pressure to achieve it. Now we go to 60% drug load. Now you'll notice that the blue, the direct compression, isn't even on the graph. It's down here. Our flow ability was not acceptable. We were not able to run a 60% APAP drug load on a rotary tablet press. The flow ability wasn't there. Our weights were not consistent enough. So that's the point of granulation. Well, look at the roller compacted one. We didn't achieve our one or two, but we did get a little bit below one. So if we needed to do roller compaction and we need to hit that one, we would reformulate a little bit. We can change some of the processes on the roller compactor, uh, roll speed, auger speed, and all this that will influence the resulting tablet strength. But look at the uh, high shear granulation blend, which is the gray. 
we achieved our one relatively low and we never achieved our two um, to this leveling off this is what i'm talking about with uh, pushing our product until it fails you see as we increase pressure we have this linear portion now it's starting to level off now it's really leveling off here same thing with the dry granulation a roller compacted blend you got this linear portion now it's leveling off this leveling off here is where we meet this maximum compactability or compressibility we really don't want to compress in that area because when we're over compressing in this area this is where we see capping capping issues occur when you reach this maximum compactability and you keep increasing that pressure you're going to have worse capping um, this is a very common issue i see in manufacturing uh, where they give us a call on the toilet and say, hey, I'm having capping issues. Okay, let's go in, take a look at the press setup, make sure everything is set up properly, punch penetration is good. Um, the toilet also offers different head flats and different designs of head configuration to prevent these problems. But if you take the formula and run this profile, and if it looks like this, and say it's curving over right here, and let's say you're running right in this area of manufacturing, well, you're right at that over compression area. Maybe some days you got good tablets, and other days you have bad tablets. Uh, let's say purchasing found an excipient that's a few cents cheaper per kilo, so they change excipients. Now all of a sudden I'm capping. Uh, the moisture content's a little higher today, or the particle size distribution is a little different. Now I'm capping. So as a formulator, I would not want to be running in this range. I would tell my scale-up group, we need to be down here where it's linear. Well, they might say that's not enough hardness or enough tensile strength. Well, then we have to reformulate. But the point is you want to be on this linear portion uh, when you're scaling up because if you're close to this plateau this is where you're going to see all kind of compression problems okay all right now let's talk about the strain rate sensitivity studies so for the tablet ability we kept the turret speed and weight constant and we increased our pressure and we collected samples at each pressure the strain rate we want to keep our compaction pressure constant and we want to start at a slow turret speed and collect tablets. Increase speed, collect tablets, all the way up to max speed. And you'll notice on our RD30, we were able to run up to 100 RPM. Um, and you'll notice that the, the gray is the wet granulation blend, the blue is direct compression, and the orange is roller compacted. What are we looking at here? We're looking at the tablet strength as a function of the turret speed. So as we increase speed, what happens to our strength? You'll notice that we are dropping in strength. We started, let's say about, I don't know, 2 point, almost 2.2, a little bit below two. So, you know, we're losing over 10% strength from slow speed to high speed. And we're following a similar trend for the others as well. So I'm not really focused on which one has the highest tensile strength here. Um, I'm focused on the drop from the start to the end. <clears throat> And that is evaluating our strain rate sensitivity. So we can compress tablets all day at low speed on R&D and make, ta make robust tablets. But we go to a high speed manufacturing press and they're hitting so fast and the dwell times are so low, that might cause a weaker tablet. That can cause capping issues because if your material is strain rate sensitive, uh, you're going to have weaker tablets at higher speed. Okay, take a look at the 40% APAP. Same thing, tablet strength versus turret speed. Uh, it is dropping. It's not a it's not a huge drop. It's not a very significant drop, but there is a drop. So you would expect when you go to a higher speed press that you're going to have to increase some of that pressure to get to that strength you want. And remember, on a tablet ability curve, if you're up that that plateau area and you got to add more pressure because of the higher speed, well, now you might be capping. So that's why it's so important to know where you are in that curve. And then we look at the 60 percent. It's dropping as well. Um, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between 20, 40, and 60 on strain rate sensitivity, but the material definitely is strain rate sensitive, and you do want to be careful when you go from R&D into a higher speed pilot scale production press. Now, notice I'm looking at turret RPM. I can't run my RD30 at, say, 60 RPM. I made a hard tablet. Everything looks great. Disintegration, dissolution is great. Now go to my big Natoli MP500 or another production press and run it at 50 RPM. 50 RPM is different on a larger scale turret. So now we have to normalize for the turret's pit circle diameter and speak in terms of tangential velocity. So here's the, uh, an example of a turret. The pit circle diameter is center of die measurement to 180 degrees center of die. That is called your pit circle diameter. If you know that, 
You know the RPM uh, times pi divided by 60 gives you millimeters per second, gives you a velocity. Now I can run my RD30 at 50 RPM, which is probably equivalent to about uh, 500 millimeters per second. Now run my big production press at 500 millimeters per second. Now you're speaking apples to apples. You should expect similar results. Not RPM, because RPM is different for a small turret and a large turret, but the tangential velocity you can compare if you take into account the pit circle diameter, which is this here. And you'll notice down here, I've got this little, uh, this little chart, different tangential velocity versus uh, turret RPM for common industry machines out there. Uh, so if you've got a lot of tablet presses and R&D in production, you can create this chart or call Natoli. We can help you with this. And you can understand the differences between your tablet presses, especially with scalability. All right, so now we're looking at the same strain rate sensitivity data, but we're looking at the tangential velocity instead of the RPM. So same data, but just different uh, engineering units down here. So let's say I like this here, 800 millimeters per second. Now transfer that in production, run it at 800 millimeters per second. That's the right way of doing it. Not tablets per minute. I ran this at, you know, uh, so many tablets per minute. Now run this press at that many tablets per minute. That's not how you scale up. You don't want to use RPM either, and you can use tangential velocity. You can also use something called the dwell time. And the dwell time has been used for, I don't know, probably a century. Uh, the dwell time is the time in milliseconds that your punch head flap is under the compression roller. So here's examples of punch heads and different head flats. So the longer your head flap at the same turret velocity, the longer the dwell time. Okay, so when your punches hit the rolls, they're coming down vertically, coming down vertically, coming together. When it hits the head flap, it's being held at a constant strain. That punches are no longer moving vertically, it's moving horizontally. It's holding that powder or tablet at a constant strain. Uh, and that time is called your dwell time. There's a lot of literature out there that says when you increase dwell time, you get a harder tablet. That's true for a lot of products, but it's not true for all products. We have some recent studies at um, Long Island University, uh, the Tully Institute, where we studied uh, materials that had capping issues. And by reducing the head flat, the tablets were gradually getting weaker with lower dwell time. But if you had a capping issue, the smaller the head flat, it reduced the capping issue. So if you're having capping issues, don't think increase the head flat for longer dwell time is going to fix it. It might, but it's product specific. You got to do some studies. And that's something that we do here in Atoy Scientific is we do these studies for our customers. We try different dwell times, different head flats, configurations, strain rate studies, uh, tabletability profiles, and we identify what kind of material you have, what kind of deformation properties it has, and how to fix your tableting issues. Okay, so here's another chart here looking at the RD30 with different head flats. We went down as low as 4.77 millimeter head flat. Okay, we went as high as 19.69 millimeter head flat. When you buy a tool from the Tolly or your tool company that you, you purchase your tooling from, if you don't specify the head flat, you're gonna get the TSM standard or the European standard. Uh, that's a whole other discussion that you know the Tolly could provide as well. Um, but just know that if you want to do studies with different dwell times, just ask the Tolly, I wanna do this, and we can provide you with different head flats so you can perform these studies, okay? This is the same data, instead of looking at RPM, now instead of looking at tangential velocity, we're now looking at the dwell time in milliseconds. So it's the same stuff here, same profile, look and feel, but we're changing the units down here to dwell time. Um, a lot of production machines are probably running in that 12 millisecond dwell time. So they're running in this area right here. Uh, but if your machine's running at a lower dwell time, say five milliseconds, six milliseconds, I can simply just change the head flat on my punch, make it smaller, and I can achieve, uh, theoretically, I can achieve zero dwell time with no head flat. Uh, so you have a lot of flexibility here with your tools and studying your uh, your material deformation properties at different dwell times, different scales. Okay, the last thing I want to quickly talk about is the punch vertical velocity, which is called the loading rate or the consolidation time. So if you look at this here, this is one single compression event. So you have pressure on the y-axis and you have time on the x-axis. The consolidation is when the punches come together and starts to um, consolidate into particles and getting the air out. That's all of this time right here. All this time right here is your consolidation time. That's a function of your compression roll diameter. 
So if you've got a large compression roller, you're going to have a longer consolidation time at a constant turret velocity versus a small compression roller that comes down and hits real fast. The dwell time is some programs use 90% of peak to 90% on the unloading. Uh, this program uses peak to uh, 80%, but the time is still the same. It's just where they shifted it. And that is a function, again, of the, uh, the head flat of your punch and the turret velocity. And that's just a small portion of this whole event here. Use my mouse. And then after we release the load, the relaxation time occurs. So this is one single compression event. The dwell time is a small area here. The consolidation time is a large uh, portion of this compression event. So let me, let me say this. If you've got a tablet press with a very large roll and you're running with the head flat of say nine and a half millimeter, running at a constant velocity. Now you're running another press with a small roller, the same turret velocity with the same head flat, nine and a half. Well, you're gonna get the same dwell time for these different presses because the head flat's nine and a half millimeter. It hits the roll, comes down, it rise nine and a half millimeter, no matter how big or small the roll is. But the press with the larger roller is gonna have more consolidation time, which is more time to get the powder consolidated and, and get the air out and get the particles touching each other. So the roll size is very important. And you'll notice with new presses today, the pre-compression roller diameter is the same as the main compression. Why? Because pre-compression wants to get the air out and consolidate. So the larger the roll, the more effective it is. Okay. All right, so a quick summary. Uh, we talked about the compaction emulator, which is the presser. We can emulate manufacturing rates up to two meters per second. We can characterize the deformation properties. Is it dominant elastic? Is it dominant plastic or brittle that allows us to formulate with the appropriate excipients to make a robust tablet at high speed manufacturing? We can normalize the data for pressure, tin saw strength, solid fraction, and so on. And then we talked about the rotary press, the MP uh, RD30. Uh, we looked at the dosing cam, fill cam, that mismatch there, which is very important. We talked about pre-compression, main compression. We talked about ejection and takeoff are two separate stages. If you have ejection problem, we fix it a certain way. If you're having a sticking problem from a takeoff or picking, we address that a different way. Okay. Uh, we also talked about strain rate sensitivity studies, where we want to know if our material is sensitive to the loading rate or the dwell time or the tangential velocity, and we normalize all that data as well. Okay. All right. With that, I want to thank you guys for your attention, and I'm going to hand it back over to Carrie. Thank you, Robert. Today's webinar was the third and final of our tablet formulation techniques series. It would be great if you could fill out the feedback form provided by the QR code and let us know how you liked our combined webinar. Also, if we were not able to address your questions today, please provide us with your questions on the feedback form. It looks like we have run out of time for questions, but please be sure to fill out the feedback form and supply us with your questions and we will get, excuse me, we will be in contact as soon as possible. On behalf of Natoli Scientific, Granny Tools, Alexander Work, Diasna, and LIU's Natoli Institute for Industrial Pharmacy R&D. We thank you for joining us for this event. We look forward to hearing from you soon and hope to see you in the near future. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much.